I was speaking of the pattern of imagery in the Bible and of its various categories, and particularly of the way in which these three phases of history are reflected in biblical imagery. And <coughs> we saw that in <coughs> that it's, it's a characteristic of this type of image that the <coughs> group form and the individual form are metaphorically identified with each other. <coughs> and the ambiguity in the symbolism attached to the Messiah is that in each category he is regarded as both master and victim as <clears throat> the shepherd of the flock and at the same time the sacrificial lamb and in the same way his uh, human function is that of a king but he's a spiritual king and in the physical world he's only a mock king put to death and <clears throat> in the urban we saw that the city is identified with the bride, Jerusalem, and the <coughs> temple is, that is, the house of the God in the middle of the city, is identified in the Gospels and in the book of Revelation and elsewhere with the <coughs> body of Christ. Jesus says in the Gospels, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days, and the book of Revelation is insistent that in the New Jerusalem there is no temple because the body of Christ has replaced it. The, uh, <clears throat> there are various ramifications of this imagery that we need to look at. <clears throat> For one thing, the archetype, so to speak, the, uh, the original models of these three phases of Israelite civilization are established before the time that Israel appears on the historical scene, that is, before the time of Abraham. Uh, <clears throat> almost the first story in the Bible is the story of the rivalry between the two sons of Adam, Cain and Abel. Cain is a farmer and Abel is a shepherd. And disputes between a farmer and a shepherd are thousands of years older than the Bible. <clears throat> they go back to Sumerian times, but usually in Sumerian times, it's the farmer that has the best of the argument, as would be very natural for a country that's dependent entirely on irrigation and is primarily an agricultural country. But in the Old Testament, the original pastoral relationship of, of uh, wandering herds is idealized as the time when Israel was united with its God. And we find that idealizing of the pastoral life in the 23rd Psalm, in the imagery of the Good Shepherd attached to Christ and elsewhere, as I mentioned. <clears throat> Abel, who was murdered by Cain, is a shepherd and his offering, we are told, is accepted by God, whereas Cain, as a farmer, his offerings are first fruits of the crops, 
is not accepted. And we are not really told why this is so, but it establishes the types of the later liturgical pattern. The primary sacrifice is the sacrifice of the lamb, and that is the one that's laid down for us in the story first of Abraham's command to sacrifice his son Isaac, where at the last minute he is stopped from doing so and a ram is substituted. And that story indicates, therefore, that for Israel the sacrifice of a lamb is to replace the sacrifice of a, of a son or of a human being. And that is confirmed later on by the story of the Passover, which is the primary rite in the Jewish liturgy. And the Passover offering is the offering with blood, which is the fundamental reason, or at least so far as there is a reason, why Abel's sacrifice is acceptable and that of Cain's is not. Eventually, of course, the farmer's <coughs> offerings of first fruits were added, and so the calendar developed three major festivals, the Passover, which is pastoral in imagery, and then the festivals of the harvest and of the vintage which uh, developed into the Jewish and Christian Pentecost and the vintage one became the Feast of Booths and eventually the, the New Year in Judaism. <clears throat> but this imagery of harvest and vintage becomes established rather later and Apparently, the story of Noah has something to do with the establishing of <clears throat> an agricultural pattern of life. That is, after the flood, Noah institutes a tremendous massacre of animals in honor of God, and God, we are told, highly approved of the smell, and uh, he said, That's, that smells pretty good, I better take the curse off the ground that I put on it at the time of Adam's fall. And then he promises Noah that there will be an unfailing cycle of seed time and harvest, the basis of an agricultural program of life. So Noah turns into a farmer and his first accomplishment, human nature being what it is, is to discover wine and get drunk. But nevertheless, the harvest and the vintage remain apocalyptic symbols along with the symbolism of the Good Shepherd and of the city. And if you look through the Gospels, you will see very frequently how fond Jesus is of these metaphors of harvest and vintage for the coming of the last day. And <clears throat> of the extent to which the animal function, the animal elements of body and blood are identified with the corresponding vegetable ones of bread and wine. That comes into the pattern of the Eucharist which Jesus is recorded as establishing at the Last Supper where he specifically identifies the wine with his blood. All right. But at the same time, when Israel embarked on a pastoral economy. That was in the time of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that time in the history is, as I say, to some degree idealized. <clears throat> when 
Israel is in Egypt, God <coughs> promises Moses from the burning bush that he will lead his people into a land flowing with milk and honey, which are not vegetable products, but what they eventually come into is a promised land where they enter upon an agricultural economy, and that, of course, meant that they were exposed to what the Old Testament writers regarded as contamination from the agricultural rights of the surrounding peoples. So it's with a certain amount of reluctance that Israel enters the Promised Land and embarks on an agricultural economy. <clears throat> and if you look, for example, at Joshua Five and twelve. The manna ceased on the morrow, that is the, the, the miraculous provision of food in the desert, which is symbolized by manna. The manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. <coughs> Uh, corn is 17th century English for any kind of grain, and uh, the first symbol of Canaan is well, it was an enormous bunch of grapes which the spies brought back from the Promised Land, and in fact the word Canaan itself means more or less red land, and its Greek equivalent is Phoenicia. It's supposed to have derived the name from another source. The purple dye from the murex shellfish, but, <clears throat> uh, but the association of redness with uh, the earth and the agricultural economy is fairly consistent throughout, throughout the, uh, the Bible. As for the urban life, the uh, Israelites are represented, first of all, as apparently desert dwellers like the Bedouins, and yet their leaders, Abraham and Moses, are described as having come from the cities, one of Mesopotamia, the other of Egypt. And <clears throat> there even seems to be some evidence that the word Hebrew, which seems to be a somewhat pejorative term when it's used by outsiders, originally meant something more like proletariat than, than a conventional name for a people. And certainly that is the role in which they appear in Egypt. <clears throat> in any case, they are compelled to live beside neighbors with other agricultural rights. I, I mentioned the law about not boiling a kid in his mother's milk and suggesting that it was a, a negative ritual, something that the Israelites were forbidden to do because their neighbors did it. And that is true also of the various agricultural cults, which had to do with in encouraging the fertility of the soil by various rituals founded on the principle of sympathetic magic. That is, if you wanted to rain, you pour water on the ground. And uh, that kind of imitation of what you want to produce by a magic, magic in a ritual is uh, <clears throat> the basis of what what we might call the dying god cults. <clears throat> 
I take the phrase dying God from Fraser, who, who investigated this question back in 1890. <clears throat> his, uh, his thesis has been refuted so often that uh, it's now time for it to come back into style again. And he speaks of many Mediterranean religions as having been founded on a cult of a god who was fundamentally a god of the fertility of the earth, and more particularly the vegetable fertility, though he is connected with animals as well. He was, as a rule, a male god, though there are exceptions, such as Persephone in Greek religion, and he is represented as related to a female principle, of whom he is sometimes the son, sometimes the lover, and sometimes the victim. And he had various names in various countries. His name in Babylonia was <coughs> Tammuz, and his name in Syria was Adonis, <clears throat> his name in Asia Minor was Attis, and in Egypt Osiris, and in Greek in Greece Dionysus, or sometimes Hyacinthus. Now, The myth associated with this god usually tells of his death. He is a victim either of the female principle he's attached to or of something representing the dead or sterile part of the year. Thus, Adonis is killed by a boar who <coughs> represents apparently the, the winter. And If you look, for example, at Ezekiel 8, the death of the god was each year ceremonially and ritually mourned by a group of women who represented the, again, the female principle of the dying god, and the female goddess represented in her turn the continuing fertility of the earth which remained dormant throughout the, the, uh, the winter or the late part of the summer. And it was the chorus of women representing this female principle, the mother or the mistress, whichever she was thought of as being, which uh, which formed a central part of the ritual for the dying god. And in verse 14, the angel who was showing Ezekiel all this in the vision brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. That is, they were carrying on the cult of the dying God, and <clears throat> that maintained itself in surrounding countries down to the time of Christ, and even in the very late book of Daniel, the, uh, the persecution of the Jews just before the Maccabean rebellion is associated with the cult of the God-beloved God of women, that is, Tammuz or Adonis. There were other rituals connected with promoting the fertility of the soil of the same general type. Again, the women who, were, who took the initiative in these cults would grow plants in pots and bring them along by forced growth. And 
would then throw the pots with the plants in them into the water as a rain charm. And these were known as gardens of Adonis. And the throwing of the, of the plants, the gardens of Adonis, into the water was a regular part of the fertility ritual. And you would expect the Hebrew prophets to take a very dim view of this practice. And if you look at Isaiah 17, for example, and verses 10 and 11, because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength, therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants and shalt set it with strange slips. In the day shalt thou make thy plant to grow and in the morning shalt thou make thy seed to flourish, but the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. So the practice of the gardens of Adonis was obviously familiar to the Israelites and practiced uh, also by them, and, uh, and here is the prophet attacking the practice as something that has nothing to do with the <coughs> Israelite religion. One of the great confrontations of the two cults is the one between Jehovah and the fertility god Baal of the Syrians. And the confrontation takes place on top of Mount Carmel, where Elijah, the prophet of Jehovah, is bringing about the end of the drought, which is causing so much misery and starvation in the country. And uh, there is a great contest between Elijah and the priests of Baal as to which god is capable of bringing rain. And uh, if you look at 1 Kings and the 18th chapter, <clears throat> it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful scene in which the priests of Baal, first of all, knock themselves out trying to uh, get their God to deliver rain out of a absolutely cloudless sky. And uh, and Elijah makes fun of them in the <clears throat> most approved charitable manner in uh, verse 27. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. Um, pursuing is a euphemism, which means perhaps after all he is making water. But uh, they, they, uh, the priests are thereby nerved to greater and greater efforts. And I noticed particularly verse 28 uh, have it there. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. Why would they do that? Hmm? Yeah, so it's sympathetic magic again. Um, that is, if you prick yourself till the blood flows, it uh, suggests that what you need very badly at that point is rain. And uh, similarly, if you look at Hosea, only here the King James translation lets you down because the King James translators didn't know much about dying god cults. Um, in Hosea 7 and 14, 
and they have not cried unto me with their heart when they howled upon their beds. The King James Bible has they assemble for corn and wine, but that's wrong. They, uh, what Hosea is saying is that they gash themselves for corn and wine. That is, they cut themselves so the blood flows. <clears throat> Now, the root of all this, which you can trace in the Bible also, is that the first fruits of the crop should be offered to the God. Uh, it is assumed that the God, like the God of Noah, lives off the smell of the offerings, and uh, he has to be fed first, otherwise disaster will result. And some of these cults seem to involve an original cult where the sacrificial victim is a human being. And the human being might have been the leader of the society, the divine king according to Fraser, or his eldest son, or later on a criminal or a prisoner taken captive in battle. And so you get a certain sequence of sacrificial victims. You get an original one where where the original victim would be the divine king himself. And that is, the king would be regarded as containing within himself the fertility of the land over which he rules. So that it would be only common sense to put him to death as soon as his strength begins to fail because his virility and the fertility of his country are bound up together by sympathetic magic. But if you're going to put him to death as soon as his strength fails, there's no sense letting all that divinity go to waste. And so uh, there could be a ritual banquet in which his body was eaten and his blood drunk so that he, the divine essence of this figure passed into the body of his worshipers. Well, whether that rite ever existed or not as a historical fact could not matter less. The point is that it matters symbolically. It's the right one to have there at the, at the beginning of the sequence. And uh, then there follows the sacrifice of the king's eldest son, because it leads for a certain, to a certain amount of social insecurity, for reasons I don't need to go into, if you keep putting a king to death as, as, uh, as soon as his strength is alleged to fail. So you get instead the sacrifice of the eldest son, and that is the stage which you have recorded in the story of Abraham's order to sacrifice his son Isaac an order which at the last moment is uh, rescinded and the sacrifice transferred to a ram. And this is incorporated into the Israelite code. If you look, for example, at the list of commandments given in Exodus 34, One of these commandments, this is a, probably a Decalogue much older than the more familiar Ten Commandments that are in Exodus 20. <clears throat> but this commandment in verse 19 says, All that openeth the womb is mine, and every firstling among thy cattle, whether ox or sheep that is male, 
And then it goes on to say that the first firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou redeem him not, then thou shalt break his neck. All the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem. That is, every firstborn son is technically an offering to God. But the actual sacrifice is not to be carried through. He is to be redeemed, redeemed uh, usually by a lamb, that being the, the pattern established in the story of Abraham and Isaac and in the story of the Passover. In, well, you can see here the working of the principle that offering God as a sacrifice, what you most want yourself, gets to be inconvenient after a while, and various substitutions are made. In fact, it is one of the myths in Greek mythology associated with Prometheus. The effect of Prometheus' real sin was in persuading men that the gods didn't want any of the real meat when they offered sacrifice. They'd be quite content with the, the entrails and the offal, and they were not. And uh, so, every so often, there comes the feeling that the deity wants the full payment and without cheating. We get an example for, uh, in, uh, which is ascribed again to one of the surrounding nations. In the second book of Kings, and the third chapter, and the end of the chapter, verse 27. Here, Israel is attacking the central city of Moab, one of their <coughs> neighboring enemies. Neighbor and enemy were practically the same word in the ancient world. And we are told that when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even unto the king of Edom, who was his ally at the time, but they could not. Then he took his eldest son, that should have reigned in his stead, and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. So that when he's in a desperate situation, he makes the original offering of his own eldest son that should have reigned in his stead. And the last sentence is quite clearly a very clumsy editorial effort to conceal the fact that in the original story the stratagem worked and the Israelites were in fact driven off. And <clears throat> the sacrifice of human beings of that, in that uh, context is what is prohibited in the Bible Archaeologists have discovered an inscription of this King Mesha of Moab who sacrificed his eldest son, and it's obvious from that inscription that his piety towards his god Chemosh was just as authentic as the uh, Israelite piety to, to Jehovah. But that was <clears throat> how his mind worked and how in some context the Israelite mind would work too. We are also told that after Jericho was taken by Joshua, a curse was put on the city, that whoever rebuilt, rebuilt it would have to sacrifice his eldest son at the beginning and his youngest son at the end of the rebuilding of the city, which is a terrible curse. The only thing is that trade routes are much more important than children, and Jericho is one of, apparently one of the world's oldest inhabited sites. So the city was rebuilt 
and the person who rebuilt it sacrificed his eldest son to begin the operation and his youngest son to finish it. <clears throat> All right. Sorry? Gosh, I can't remember his name, but uh, it's. Uh, it's in the. It was done in the reign of Solomon, and uh, <clears throat> it, it is. Uh, it is somewhere in the account of Solomon. The. Uh, But the, the original curse is pronounced in the book of Joshua, and, uh, and the, uh, the working out of the curse, so to speak, is, uh, uh, takes, takes place in Solomon's reign. I'm sorry I don't have the precise reference here. <clears throat> uh, it's possible. Um, the list of commandments in Exodus 34 ends with the phrase, the Ten Commandments. And you notice that, the, that this group of commandments in Exodus 34 is much more concerned with ritual than the, than the more familiar set in Exodus 20. The, the more familiar Decalogue has moral commandments uh, against murder and adultery and stealing. And that suggests a, a slightly later cultural phase uh, the more primitive one would be concerned almost entirely with the, uh, the ritual obligations to the god. But uh, that's, uh, that's all very, uh, very hypothetical. Nobody quite knows. But uh, I suspect that the, uh, that the original cannibal feast, which is, which is original in the sense of being symbolically original, may not have actually been practiced by any society. I think human beings only turn to, cannib to cannibalism when they run out of other supplies of protein. And, uh, they, uh, <clears throat> and even, even a, uh, a ritual banquet, as solemn as that one would be, might not have been carried through in quite so literal a way. We don't know. <clears throat> In any case, the Israelites were extremely familiar with the cult of human sacrifice, particularly the sacrifice of firstborn sons. And although that is condemned, they are much more neutral on the question of the sacrifice which is to fulfill a vow or is a sacrifice of a, of a prisoner taken in war. That may be a sacrifice not merely acceptable to God, but actually demanded by him. And uh, we, uh, we find a similar story in the book of Judges and the 11th chapter. You notice that in the commandment in Exodus 34, female animals, whether, whether animal or human, are lawfully ignored. But uh, the story of Jephthah uh, says that he made a vow to sacrifice the first thing to God when he came back from his battle, if he won the battle. You notice that the psychological basis of sacrifice is very frequently a bargaining basis. The formula is do ut des, I give that you may give. And uh, that is what prayer in Homer, for example, very largely consists of. It consists of reminding the gods very pointedly that they have been very well fed by the hero's sacrifice in the past. And if they wish the supply to be continued, they better come through with some more victories. And this is a typical folk tale of a rash vow type, where 
Jephthah says he will sacrifice the first thing that comes to meet him, and returning from the battle if he is victorious, and of course what is the first thing to meet him is his only daughter. And <clears throat> at the end of chapter 11 of the book of Judges, uh, in verse 27, his daughter says that he has to go through with the sacrifice, seeing that he has made the vow. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down in the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, Go. And then at the end of the chapter, we are told that it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah four days in a year. So there are two things to notice there. One is her virginity, which makes her the unblemished and consequently acceptable sacrificial victim. And the other is the fact that she becomes the center of a cult of mourning women. Uh, so that the original religion associated with this story is clearly something much older than the Mosaic code. If you look at the book of Zechariah, the second last book in the Old Testament, and right at the end of, uh, of Zechariah in chapter 12, And I will pour upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Rimmon of the valley of Megiddo. Now Hadad Rimmon is simply another fertility god of this type whose uh, cult took the form of being mourned, is his death being mourned by a group of women. And one thing that is interesting about this prophecy in Zechariah is that the phrase, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, is quoted in the Gospel of John, which means that the authors of the Gospels were thoroughly familiar with the symbolism of dying god cults and incorporated that symbolism into their accounts of the Passion. You remember that Jesus is followed to his execution by a mourning chorus of women whom he addresses as daughters of Jerusalem. In uh, in the book of Micah, which is in the middle of the Minor Prophets, there is another reference which contains a verse which is often regarded, I think with considerable justification, as one of the great moral breakthroughs in history. And uh, in chapter 6 of Micah, and verse 6, Micah says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee? but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God." Now what is fascinating about that fifth verse, about the, I'm sorry, the seventh verse, is that the question whether one should not fall back on the original demand of the firstborn son as a sacrificial victim was still familiar enough for the prophet to 
refer to it as a moral problem. And, of course, what he is saying is that this whole bargaining basis of sacrifice, uh, of making a reparation for something you've done wrong and so forth, is, is utter nonsense. And that uh, <clears throat> one has to get onto a, a new level of apprehension altogether. But before he says that, he says that it is possible that the people around him are still wondering whether, in the event of a sufficiently desperate situation, they ought not to re fall back on the original right. Any question that far then? As I say, this, <coughs> this um, dying god cult was extremely common all over the Mediterranean. You, you can't look in classical literature without seeing that, and Theocritus of Sicily has several uh, idols on the uh, festival of Adonis, and, uh, or at least he has one on the festival of Adonis and had a great many references to it. And, uh, <coughs> The cult of Attis, whose female principal was Cybele, was uh, transferred to Rome during the Punic Wars of Hannibal, for largely for political reasons. And there it, it took the form, as most of these cults did, of a three-day spring festival. And on the first day, an effigy representing the god was hung on a tree, and the effigy was supposed to die. The second was the day when the god was absent from the world and the priests lashed themselves into orgiastic frenzies and castrated themselves as part of their sacrifice to their god. And then there's an ode of Catullus about that, which is a, a very powerful and very terrible poem. And then on the third day, in the morning of the third day, there was a ritual procession to the marshes or somewhere where the body of the reborn god was supposed to be, uh, to be discovered. And so it's that pattern of symbolism that uh, had been soaking into the minds of Mediterranean peoples for many centuries. <clears throat> well, we'll go on with that next day then. <clears throat>